Hello. Well, here we are again. I've been reviewing what I said to you in our last session, and I notice I, at one point I, I made a, a slip of the tongue. I said Joseph of Arimathea buried the body of Jesus on Friday morning. Of course, it was Friday afternoon. Uh, the point of the hasty burial was to take the body down from the cross before Sabbath, which began at sunset. Jewish tradition required the dead, whether they were righteous or unrighteous, be properly interred, and a corpse left hanging on a gibbet during a festival would defile the land. And, uh, and Pilate will, of course, give his permission for this, since once he was quite sure the victim was really dead, since it was Roman practice to respect local custom, as long as it didn't interfere with Roman policies or plans. Right. Well, back to Luke's story. We left our two disciples, one of them called Cleopas, we don't know what the other one's called, on the road to Emmaus, together with the risen Jesus, although they don't yet know it's, it's Jesus. And the Lord has just asked them what they've been talking about. And if you want to follow in your Bibles, we're at Luke chapter 24, uh, verse 18. So, um, Clepus answers rather brusquely. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, he says, who don't know these things that have taken place in the last few days? Jesus asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and, and crucified him. You notice something we mentioned last time, I think, that again, characteristically, Luke emphasizes that it wasn't the Jewish people as a whole who delivered Jesus up. It was their leaders. Uh, but we had hoped, Cleopas says, that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. The, the, the choice of expression is very striking. That's precisely what was prophesied of Jesus at the beginning of the gospel when he was an infant in his mother's arms. In, in fact, while he was even before he was born, God, Zachariah said, has visited and wrought redemption for his people. And then the aged Anna, the prophetess in the temple, when um, Mary and Joseph came to present Jesus, proclaimed Jesus to all, uh, Luke says, who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. So the phrase is carefully chosen, but Cleopas hasn't finished. Yes, and besides all this, he says, it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they didn't find his body there, they came back and told us that they'd indeed seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Cleopas's report of the women's story is a bit ambiguous, for while the two men in dazzling clothes have now become angels, it isn't really clear whether this is a patronising parody of the women's story or a heightened rehearsal of it. What is clear, however, is that by now Peter isn't the only one who's verified some part of the women's account, for, according to Cleopas, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. The tomb was empty, which was strange indeed. But then Cleopas adds, but him they did not see. And the word him, auton, placed at the beginning of the phrase, auton de eidon, is emphatic. Without Jesus' presence, the empty tomb is strange, but it is merely strange, an oddity, a quirk of history, something to be explained. It's nothing more. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Cleopas and his companion, and everyone who thought like them, they weren't wrong to look for 
to Jesus for the redemption of Israel, they were only wrong in that they, in that they didn't set that promise in its proper context. And in particular, because they left something out, something of which the disciples had indeed during Jesus' ministry been told more than once, and of which the risen Jesus now reminds them. Was it not necessary, he says, that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And the phrase necessary, the word necessary, points, as so often in the evangelists, to the divine purpose. And then the Lord goes on. Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, says Luke, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. That's to say, Israel's scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. Let's not skip over this too fast. I still hear it sometimes said that the followers of Jesus of Nazareth appropriated or adapted the Jewish scriptures as if we'd taken over something that was really alien to us. Nothing could be further from the truth. On the contrary, the early Christians, and indeed Jesus himself, were formed in the Jewish scriptures, and from the beginning they knew no other way to speak of Jesus or his mission or his message except in terms of those scriptures. We remember Jesus as a preacher of the kingdom of God. Where did the idea of the kingdom of God come from? It came from the Jewish scriptures. And as, as he himself said, according to Luke, on one occasion in the synagogue at Nazareth, referring to a prophecy from Isaiah, he said, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. As Christians, we are always in danger of losing our way if we forget that our roots are God's revelation of him. Our root, I would say, <laughs> our root is God's revelation of himself to Israel. Well, back to our story. As they came near to the village to which they were going, Jesus walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's, it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. Now, perhaps Luke's uh, Greco-Roman hearers, familiar with the motif of a, his, of a hero who, like Odysseus, returns home but isn't recognised, perhaps they would have become a little alert at this point. Anyway, Luke goes on. Then, when Jesus was reclining at table with them, he took bread, broke, blessed, I'm sorry, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and was giving it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. Well, naturally, as we hear these words, took, blessed, broke, was giving, we're reminded of Jesus feeding the crowd, and of the Last Supper, and, and I presume we're meant to be. The hero has returned to his own, the person we thought was our guest turns out to be our host. But notice how precise Luke is following simple past tenses for the three earlier verbs. He took, he blessed, he broke. He then uses the imperfect tense for the last, was giving. Vividly suggests that it's the very moment when Jesus offers the loaf that the disciples' eyes are opened. I don't know if you know the painting by Caravaggio of this scene, which very powerfully conveys that our Lord is actually offering the bread to the disciples. And there you go, oh, it's you. And, says Luke, he vanished from their sight. <laughs> Those who in Luke's audience who are familiar with Israel's scriptures Perhaps they thought of stories of divine revelation and departure, like, like God appearing to Abraham or Jacob or Gideon. But in any case, what Luke is doing here is showing himself a master of understatement. And what he's indicating is that already the resurrected Messiah is not bound by the limitations of earthly life as we know it. 
Already he is entering into his glory. Cleopas and, and his friend look at each other. And they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? Now that their eyes are opened, the disciples understand not just what they were being taught on the road, but who was teaching them. That same hour, says Luke, they got up. The point being, of course, it was late, even before they went into supper. Nevertheless, all this is too important for them to delay sharing it with their fellow disciples, even for a few hours. And so at once they returned to Jerusalem and there they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. But now comes a surprise. Cleopas and his companion are upstaged. They're bringing big news. But it turns out that by now, not only the women, but even the eleven already know it. They were saying, the Lord is risen indeed. And the Lord is used absolutely. It is, of course, the Lord Jesus. And then there's another surprise. What we might have expected would be presented as an important story in its own right is virtually sort of backed into the narrative as if it were something incidental. And he has appeared to Simon, they say. And that's all. Luke offers a report, but no description. He refers to the appearance of Simon Peter, and of course it is important. It's the basis on which Luke will strengthen his brothers, as the Lord promised him at the Last Supper. And it's the grace given by the risen Christ to someone who's going to play a reading, leading role in the early days of the Christian community, as depicted in Luke's second volume. Nevertheless, at this point, once it's been reported, file by title, you might say, Luke then allows the disciples of the Emmaus Road to tell their story. And their narrative, as he presents it, is brief but very vivid. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And this is the first time that Luke uses the phrase, the breaking of the bread, which will later in the book of Acts be his shorthand for the Eucharist. He will use it several times. And we're surely meant to have in mind the Eucharist here and our continuing encounter with Christ thereby. But the story goes on. While they were talking about this, Luke tells us, Jesus himself stood among them. The risen Jesus is still bound by no limitations of space or place. He comes and goes as he will. He offers them a traditional greeting. Shalom, peace be with you. Traditional but meaning so much on his lips. For Luke from the beginning of the gospel has spoken of Jesus as one whose coming to his people is the proclamation of peace. And Jesus himself told his disciples in the Gospels that peace, that was how they were to greet the households they visited. The disciples, however, says Luke, were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a spirit. He said to them, why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And then while he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. Luke really seems to go to extraordinary lengths in this passage to establish not merely the presence of the real Jesus, whom they'd known before, see that it is I myself, but the reality of his physical presence, marked not only by inviting the disciples to touch him, 
but by his insistence on sharing food with them. Perhaps some people regarded the presence of the risen Jesus as, as just the manifestation of an angel rather than a resurrection. And it was certainly an accepted feature of angels that they didn't eat. Read the book of Tobit if you don't believe me. And this would certainly explain the extraordinary vigour with which Luke now insists that the risen Jesus ate in his disciples' presence and that he was overall physically present with them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Again, it is emphasised the whole of Israel's scripture is relevant to who Christ is and what Christ does. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Clearly, there's some repetition in this of what's already been said to Cleopas and his companion. But now it goes much further. Cleopas and his friend needed assurance that the suffering of the Messiah before his entry into glory was to be expected. The disciples must now learn, however, that not only the suffering and re resurrection of the Messiah, but also the entire mission of the people of God is to follow from this. They are to proclaim to all nations repentance with a view to the forgiveness of sins. And their doing this too will be according to the scriptures. We might, of course, think of Abraham being told that in your seed all the nations shall bless themselves. But Luke, for his part again, of course, he's pointing us back to the beginning of his narrative because the forgiveness of sins was what was promised in the proclamation of John the Baptist. At the same time, he's making a decisive turn forward towards his second volume for the story of the preaching of the gospel, calling for repentance and offering the forgiveness of sins beginning from Jerusalem is precisely the story that the book of Acts will tell. And that's why Jesus says to them, you are the witnesses of these things. Witness, to be a witness. A witness, Greek word maturos, from whence of course we get our martyr. A witness, one who in word and deed affirms and attests Jesus Christ and thereby gives glory to God. That's the main element in being the church. And to say we believe in an apostolic church is to say we believe in a sent church, but that's what the word apostolic means. And this witness is what we are sent to do. But the apostles don't have to bear that witness in their own strength. There is still another sending. See, says our Lord, I am sending upon you the promise of my Father. The word promise again reminds us of the proclamation of John the Baptist, but it also looks forward to Acts and Pentecost when the disciples will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, stay here in the city, Jesus says until you have been clothed with power from on high. Just as the successors of Moses and Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament receive a portion of their spirit, so also the disciples of Christ will be empowered. Once again, we're being pointed back to the beginning of the gospel, for the power by which Mary conceived was the power of the Most High. 
and were pointed forward again to the book of Acts, to the empowerment of the disciples at Pentecost. Then Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, Luke tells us, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was being carried up into heaven. The destiny toward which Jesus has been moving from the beginning of the gospel is now complete. The resurrection life is not an end in itself any more than this life is. For Christ, and incidentally for us, resurrection life like this life will have a purpose. And that purpose is union with God, the union of God for which we were created. And, says Luke, they worshipped him. Even as he's parting from the disciples, again, Luke's use of tenses is very precise here. Even as he's parting from them, the disciples bow before him in adoration, as the Jews of old bowed to the high priest to receive his blessing. And having done so, says Luke, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple blessing God. And so Luke's gospel ends where it began, precisely where it began, in the temple at Jerusalem, with the praises of God, to whom Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we now ascribe as his most justly due, or might, majesty, dominion, and power, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.